Industry data breach reports gather data from real-world security incidents and data breaches. This offers really valuable information on attack trends, threat vectors, vulnerabilities, and best practices to help organizations enhance their cybersecurity strategies. One of which is the Verizon Data Breach Investigations Report. It's an annual publication by Verizon, and it provides in-depth analysis and insights into the current cybersecurity landscape. Let's jump in and do a little analysis on it. You should find it inside of your lab data folder. Just double click the Verizon DBIR 2023 report. These types of reports are meant to be accessible by both technical and non-technical audiences. We'll have cover art, we'll have very well formatted presentation of data and table of contents that is simple and concise to use. Scrolling through the report onto page four, we can see how the report is formed. It's actually derived from the Varus framework, and that quantifies three things. The threat actor, which is the who, threat actions, so what action did they take, and then the variety, what are the specifics of the action? And there will typically be links like on the bottom of this page here to the Varus framework or other reports that use their own frameworks to get a sense of how they gather their data and then compile it to information inside of a report. So looking through the Varus framework, it's pretty extensive. As I mentioned, it covers those three quantifiable things of threat actor, actions, and variety. But to get there, it's quite detailed. It has a large data collection for analysis and offers a standardized vocabulary for describing and categorizing security incidents. Such as looking at these actions variables over here, we can see action.malware. The question to answer that is, was there evidence of malware? So by running all of your incidents through this type of framework, you can get really specific granular level of detail. And then ultimately, it can output a report like the Verizon DBIR. Now, moving on inside of the report, if we scroll down to page five, reports like this of this nature typically come with examples of how they format their data. So these are some examples of what their charts might look like, how to read them, and how to interpret the information at least the way that they're intending you to understand. Scrolling further into it, we do have a little introduction here. And typically, you'll see these as a little thank you to contributors and to frameworks that can make it all happen. And there's an important quote on this page, actually. So they like to say here that success is stumbling from failure to failure with no loss of enthusiasm, attributed to Sir Winston Churchill. That's very true to cybersecurity. That's a good way to put it. After intros, we'll have something like a summary of findings. So let's pause here and look at this page. Typically, we'll see here the most important or most impactful types of findings right away for the reader to understand the best bang for buck result if you dedicate some effort and resources towards it. In this case, pretexting, so social engineering types of attacks, is on the rise drastically. We're hovering just a little bit over 4% over here. So you can imagine one in 25-ish of your personnel will fall victim to social engineering. That's actually a pretty high number. We also see 74% of all breaches include the human element. That can be user error, privilege misuse, stolen creds, and again, social engineering. Interestingly as well, 83% of the breaches involved external actors. So perhaps 17% are internal actor related. 17% of your staff are involved with the breach. And we can see that overwhelmingly that it's financially driven. In fact, 95% of breaches are financially motivated. So that's a really interesting insight to take away. Finally, we can see that the three primary ways in which attackers access an organization are stolen credentials, phishing, and exploitation of vulnerabilities. With phishing and credentials being the vast majority of that ratio. So it really is just the basics that seems to be the problem. Going a little bit deeper now into page nine, we can see some more interesting information that ransomware is definitely on the rise. So we saw a huge jump from 2021 onwards. It seems to sort of plateaued a little bit, but it hasn't really gotten better. It sort of just got really worse and then it stayed pretty steady right there. So you can expect trends like that to continue to occur into 2024 as a result. And now moving past some of those more important summaries, we get to sections like results and analysis inside of a report. And this starts breaking things down a little bit more granularly and looking at threat actors and types of attacks. So let's look at page 12 now. We can see that 19% of breaches included the internal elements. 
And that's not necessarily intentional either, as they're trying to explain here. But that really suggests that almost one in five people in a business will be the ones responsible for a breach. That's a pretty high number. And if you weren't sure what internal threat actors would be like, they have a bit of a description here in the side to explain that it encompasses full-time employees, independent contractors as well. So it's extensive. Let's move on to page 13 now to start breaking this down further. Here we can see that 94.6% of the breaches were motivated by financial. And interestingly of which, we can see that organized crime is responsible for approximately 70%. And another interesting comparison here is that the end user is more apparent in breaches than nation state. That's something to think about. We think about these really large, highly functional operating threat actors being heavily sponsored and funded, but truthfully, the end user is more of a threat in this case. And so with that, there's some consideration to think about. Our resources we have are finite. So what's the ratio that we should be dedicating towards internal end user matters? versus these nation state threat actors. And this is why cyber threat intelligence is so valuable because once you see the insightful information from all the data, that's when you can stop and think, are we doing all the right things or should we be doing something else? Okay, let's move on to page 14 and look at actions now and see what's taking place in these breaches. We see stolen credentials, ransomware, phishing, these all reign supreme and not that most complex backdoor type of attack. And that should be an indication again, right? It's the basics that are a threat more than the most advanced attacks. All right, now moving on to page 15, what about the varieties of these actions? The specifics, right? Well, interesting, we can see web applications is huge, right? The incidence is the category in the left column, and then we have data breaches in the middle and the right, which suggests that web application, email, and general carelessness is the result of data breaches. But incidents, look like a bit of a different type of category. Incidents seem to be revolving more around denial of service attacks and ransomware plays. However, they're not the major concern compared to web application and email vectors, which actually result in data breaches. So let's move on a little bit to page 17, and let's look at the assets that are in play that are being targeted over here. Seems that servers are the main target, but people are next. So servers technically should be what you're caring about first and then moving right over to the person to ensure that those two assets don't get compromised. So moving now on to page 19, we can start looking at attributes and this gives us a sense of what type of CIA or confidentiality, integrity, availability, what type of that has been compromised. In this case, we can see that personal and credentials and internal are the types of data that have been compromised by some degree in their CIA. And there's a pretty good little line here that helps maybe you to frame how to think about this in that the CIA of an organization can be impacted by sort of walking through this logic. If we say to ourselves, did the asset or a copy of the data get out the door? We have a confidentiality problem. Was it changed from a known and trusted state? We have an integrity problem. And do we still have access to it ourselves? That's an availability problem. So that's something like a set of guardrails to maybe help you classify incidents and data breaches when you're thinking about them and to the extent and magnitude of that they've impacted your organization or someone else's. Next, let's go down to page 21 and look at some incident patterns over time. This is going to help us get a better understanding of things about trends. On page 23, we can see how these attacks really start to ebb and flow over time. They're not really static. They sort of come and go, and depending on how the defenders are responding to attackers, you can see that there's a shift in pattern. One year it might be social engineering, the next it might be web application vulnerabilities, and then right after that, it could just be general system intrusion. So you can't get lax in any one area. Now, moving on to page 24, we can get a summary of all these system intrusions that they're talking about. We can see that 3966 incidents 1944 confirmed with data disclosure, threat actors, as we saw, largely external, internal afterwards. And if we look at some of the motivations, financial is mostly driven and the types of data compromise, other personal and system. We also see some relevant MITRE attack techniques here in the bottom that we can employ to better defend against system intrusion. And we'll get into those in another lab, but this is good to refer back to once you understand that section a little bit more in the coming lab. 
Now let's move over to page 26. And what is it that we're actually seeing for malware? Well, largely we can see that email is nearly the bulk of delivery methods here for malware with Office Docs, Windows applications being the main culprits. If we secure these areas first, we can see an immediate return on our efforts, surely. Because as you can see here in page 27, we're still dealing with ransomware, but really it's because of the vectors. Email, desktop sharing software, and web applications continue to pose a problem. So let's move on a little bit now and get to page 29, and let's look at these CIS controls. Here we can see some recommended controls from the CIS benchmarks framework, which we'll get into in the compliance fundamentals course. And similarly to MITRE ATT&CK, these are just more best practices against the most common occurrences of attacks. Again, most bang for your buck. And finally, we have social engineering stats. So this is a big one. They're not great. <laughs> so out of the 1700 incidents in this report, 928 resulted in data disclosure and primarily that being credentials. And once again, if we're looking for relevant attack techniques for MITRE, we can employ some of these on the right hand side that are highlighted for us to get some level of defense against this. And that is a data breach report. So you can see how valuable this insight is, right? I recommend you read through this thoroughly when you have some time, as this helps you figure out where to start based on industry patterns and trends. And unfortunately, it's still just really the basics, tightening up email security, attachments, web applications, social engineering and phishing, they sort of still reign supreme at the top. And what we're seeing here is it's not really the super complex hackers coming up with zero day exploits and back doors that make up the bulk of attacks, incidents and data breaches. It's really not. So this is why it's so valuable to have reports like this. This really helps you align what you should be spending your company's or your organization's resources on to better defend your perimeter. So ultimately, it really is still at the end of the day that good security is just mostly good systems administration.